presentation. Uh, today's session is going to be on where does Waldo work, maximizing our employment data. Um, I'm going to go through a variety of different slides and um, some of the things I want to cover today specifically are how to obtain employment information for your constituents. As you're looking at employment information, there's a lot of value that you can get out of that information, some which might seem obvious and some which might not seem obvious. So we're going to cover uh, uh, a couple different reasons and, and, and ways to obtain uh, employment information. Also, we're going to apply, apply the employment information. How do, we, how do we apply it more effectively to advance the mission of our organization? We'll have some very specific examples. We also want to establish and improve matching gifts. Matching gifts is a byproduct of employment information, and we'll go through some of the building blocks that we have. One of the things that you're going to hear me mention throughout the presentation, and a metric that you want to keep in mind is that one out of every 10 gifts is eligible for a match. And that's one of the things you want to think about as you're looking at your matching gift information and employment information, how close you would get into that. And finally, we're going to look at some different tools to increase your matching gift income. There's a lot out there, um, and it seems like from year to year, from what, at least from when I started about 20 years ago to where we are now, the tools just get bigger and better, um, but there's also, I think, more confusion with them, too. Um, also, we're going to look at ways to be reactive with matching gift information and how to be very proactive to get to that, you know, to maximize that 10% that are eligible for match. We need to do a lot of proactive, th proactive things. So, so let us start. Where does Walda work and why do I care? Uh, employment information is, is key to major gift prospecting. Uh, one of the things that um, with employment information, I think that's probably one of the most important things that you're going to find. Clearly, there's going to be some exceptions to that, but if I have nothing else on somebody, I know who their employer is and what they do, um, that is one of the greatest indications of wealth that somebody has. Uh, people do hide information as they mask information, uh, intentionally or unintentionally, uh, but still, if I were to have one piece of information, I mean, maybe outside of what their net assets are, uh, it would probably be employment information. Um, employment information and contact numbers are critical elements uh, for, my, for major gift fundraising. If I don't know where somebody works and how to reach them, um, I, it's going to be hard for me to do all the things that I need to do as a major gift officer to go out there and uh, you know solicit funds from some of the top donors. Employment information will help drive a more effective matching gift program, uh, clearly. Uh, you can't uh, maximize or be proactive with matching gifts if you don't know uh, where somebody works. So who needs work, Waldo's work information? Uh, major gift and the leadership team, as we just discussed, um, for all the, and for all the reasons we discussed. Annual fund. Annual fund can really be a beneficiary of uh, employment information, particularly matching gift dollars. Also at the leadership level at the annual fund. It is much easier to reach out to, you know, if you were to focus on your lower level, actually your lower level donors, your, your leadership annual fund donors, and you had to pick them, it would be those probably that have made previous gifts or those that have the right title or that have the capacity to give. And with that, obviously, is matching gift dollars that you can maximize. Again, that one, that how close are you getting to that 10%. Prospect identification for research, major gifts, volunteers, and members. The more information you have on employment, uh, the easier it is to identify the prospects. And there's some slides that I have later on that you, we just did a screening at the University of New Haven uh, uh, through an employer find, and we found a third of our um, of the people that we submitted we found new employment information for. And from that, from that, like roughly 13,000, we found a, a thousand or so that had a title of president, uh, vice president, or CEO. So again, major gifts is a big beneficiary, and it's the primary beneficiary of this, uh, but lots of secondary beneficiaries. Uh, Corporate and Foundations Relations uh, uses this information to expand relationships, maintain some of the relationships that, ex you know, that exist, and uh, to make sure that they can reach out to um, people in their, uh, their more specific and more um, sliced pool. And obviously records, the better the records you have, the easier it is to connect and enhance the value of uh, what you do at each of your organizations. Uh, internal sources for finding employment information. Uh, this is uh, pretty interesting to me because I, I like to look at, there's no one source of finding information 
for uh, for employers. There's not one you know end all and be all source. It's kind of an overall, or it's kind of like a um, a lot of different things that you have to do to get good at it. And uh, I always kind of uh, think of it as boxing. In boxing, when you're when your you know fighters are fighting each other, you know it's usually not one hit that knocks them down. It's a series of hits. It could be a high hit, a low hit, a side hit. You know, from you know all different sides. And eventually, there is going to be that one hit that knocks them down, but you don't know which one it's going to be. Well, I kind of think of it the same in here and what we do in terms of getting employment information. There's no one end-all and be-all, but if you create a good process of trying all these different, or, or you know, soliciting all these different things, um, you're eventually going to get that employment information. So let's look at some of the, the things that we have. Staff. Staff is a great source of information. Um, when a major gift officer or any 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 representative of your um, of your university or nonprofit goes out, if they find out information, how are they getting that information back into the database? We happen to use Razor's Edge, but it doesn't really matter which database you use. You want to make sure that there's a process built in, so when staff does find out, it's easily um, it, it's easy for them to make that update or communicate to the right people. Fellow constituents, uh, alums know a lot about each other. What kind of processes do you have? Events, you can go to an event. One of the things that we do when you come to events is we actually offer up the ability to update your information right on the spot. One of the things we want to put on there is employment information, or at least you know things simple things like dropping your business card and um, being able to update your information from a business card. One of, our, one of our probably most important uh, or most effective ways is through our telemarketing solicitations. When we go out and uh, we run a phone program uh, 10 weeks in the fall and 10 weeks in the spring. As part of that, once a uh, caller makes the initial contact and, and, and does the, you know, the, the first couple things in terms of just you know, warming, warming the person up and just having the conversation, the next thing that they do before they even talk about gifts or solicitation or anything like that, is just verify employment information. They they verify address information, email, phone numbers, and employment. Um, that's one of the things that we kind of have built into our scripting so that we can make sure that we're capitalizing it. So whether somebody does make a gift or not, obviously we want them to make a gift, but even if they don't, at least we're getting some value out of it, even if a gift is not made. Surveys are another great source. When you send out a survey, you can get a lot of information back. Uh, in terms of just getting, you know, surveys out, you might be looking for attitudes of, of, or you're trying to solicit more than just biographical data. But don't overlook that biographical data. Ask for an update on your website. You know, our alums are, you know, flocking to our website every day, asking to, you know, oh, I've moved, and you know, the first thing they're doing is calling the university or or a nonprofit they're associated with. Um, in and of itself, that alone is not going to do it. But again, it's just one of many different ways. That being said, we probably get a, you know, half a dozen uh, to a dozen every day in terms of just uh, address updates. And you know, when we send an email out or a blast email out, you know, that number you know go, goes up significantly. We could get 20, 30, 40 different um, people saying that they've updated their information. So take advantage of those things. Social networking sites, and we'll cover that in more detail shortly. And we actually also run a tracer. Um, what we do with our tracer is all it is, is it's basically a survey, but just on biographical data. We send them out. Uh, I've done them in the past where I've done them to reunion classes. I've also done them where, um, for instance, one of the things that we've learned through our phone program this fall is that we've had a drop off in our um, alumni donors from the classes of the 80s and the 90s. So during those two decades, we did not have a lot of telephone information. So we are actually sending out a tracer to those two decades, uh, not all at once, but in smaller groups, and trying to reach out and get uh, more information. All we're asking for is, well, what we're putting in our, in our mail piece that goes out is what information we have. And the, the logic behind that is that people are more apt to reply uh, to a to a mailer that you send out that has wrong information than if it has correct information. When I've done this in the past, we've gotten a 17% response rate 
on people's information. So something might have been wrong, and they cross it off and put on the right thing. And we also put a you know business reply envelope, so we're picking up the postage on it uh, the way back. Another way to just make it more effective. Again, not one way, but many ways. I think that's the key takeaway on this: is to try many different things. Where does Waldo work? Uh, I have this slide here because there's just many different ways to keep up with all the different sources, depending on your organization. I won't go through each one, but as you can see, mail, development officers, phone calling, emailing, online, United Way, depending on the type of organization you are. There's many different things or many different sources of information. And then how do you, you know, I'm a big process person, so what's your process? to make sure you get that information and you get it updated into your database. And it's going to be different for every organization. For us, it's through our, um, you know, our biographical and records person whose main responsibility, quite frankly, their only responsibility is to make sure that, that they uh, get information. And it's, it's, it's not her alone, but it's just a combination of her and the different processes that we have built in, you know, tied into all the different sources. There's also external sources of employment information, uh, the individual, individual themselves, employers. One of the things that we do with employers is we run a uh, program where we will go out and go to an employer and connect with them. And we do this not a lot, but probably a handful times a year, where we're going out and we'll have an event. Our manager gives staff, you know, in conjunction usually with a key alum who works at one of the organizations, We'll go out and we'll have a breakfast or a luncheon or some type of speaker series. And from that, what we can do is we can you know, uh, uh, collaborate information on what donors or what alumni work at, 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 that, at the particular place. So for example, all the alumni from the University of New Haven that work at XYZ Company, um, HR usually will work with us because we're just trying to validate you know, the information that they have versus what we have. And we'll get a list from HR of all the people that have, you know, on their resume or on their uh, on their database where their uh, alma mater is, and we'll you know cross reference it with what we have. And it's amazing how much information that we pick up. But we also share that information with uh, with a company. Again, we're not doing this across the base, but we're usually doing this with employers that we have critical mass in terms of number of uh, alumni that work there because um, that's where it makes the most sense, but that's just another way to go about and get that information. Of course, there's the government, there's tax records, real estate holdings, securities, and filings. And there's, there are also, there's also the ability to research companies. And with researching companies, uh, with a name, address, email, research is almost possible across many publicly available databases. Uh, we use LexisNexis. Um, we also use another product called iWave. Uh, which provides data, um, it, it, there is a fee, but it provides a lot of data that you can search on. One of the things with this, one of the limitations with this, of course, is that it's one off. It's only one at a time. It's not able to do a whole bunch at, at one time. Um, where there's some of these databases uh, have over one million personal names and titles, and um, you can get a lot of information, a lot of detailed information on individuals. HEP also offers the employer find information, which we have run it three different times uh, in, since 2010 at the University of New Haven, where you can search many at one time. Um, and I'll share with you some of the results that we've had uh, in, a, in, a, in an upcoming slide. But again, this whole, it's, it's not a, doesn't have the same depth as maybe a LexisNexis does, but it ties in some social media data and some um, you know, public and private company information to uh, make a right match based on the al algorithm that they provide. Uh, and again, it finds over 100 different databases and finds the best one. And it does give you the ability to import the information. Um, again, this also, you know, and this is a good time to talk about our matching gifts. This will tie in and it meshes in with the matching gift services. Um, and some of the results that, that we have this year kind of shocked me. Every time I run, some of these programs, it always shocks me with uh, the information that we get back. One of the things that, before we go too much into the, into the match gifts, one of the things that really um, you have to look at your database is uh, the building blocks, uh, what I call the building blocks. 
And it all starts at the bottom. Your first level is just you've got to have donor names. Once you know who your names are or who your constituents are, you need to have a regular process, and I'm a firm believer of that, of making sure that your address, your phone numbers, and your cell phones are updated on a regular basis. If you don't have that process built in, um, it's, it's impossible uh, to keep up with it um, because the numbers change so fast. Same thing with emails, too. I think that's kind of level two. That the first level is what I call donor names. You know, that, that's, that's your ticket into the game. The second level is address, phone number, cell phones, and emails. To get to that next level uh, where, you know, you're getting a lot more, much more valuable information, like employment and matching gifts, you have to have the first two levels in place. You really can't go too much further because so much of what gets tied into finding uh, employment information and matching gift information are things like emails and like addresses and cell phone numbers for all the reasons we said on the previous slide. Once you get to level two and you have a, a firm grasp of level two, it's employment information, the, the HEP employer find, and the matching gift eligibility uh, on finding that information out for companies. But again, it's an ongoing process. It's not like you can um, you know, update cell phones one time, and from there you're going to have good information forever. It's going to be good for a period of time, but you need to kind of budget that. And that's one of the things that I do at New Haven is we budget um, at least one. Well, we're doing addresses four times a year. Uh, we're doing phone numbers at least once. And I'll share an example with you in a moment with cell phones where we're, we actually are doing it a couple times a year. And we have some very specific um, reasons why. Uh, the emails, I like doing that at least once a year, depending on what uh, you know how much money and budget I have. And again, the employment information and the matching gift, not quite on an annual basis, but not far from it, probably every two years, no more than three years before we go ahead and repeat that process. Let me share an example that we had of uh, employment or uh, cell phone, or excuse me, uh, from our phone program. We were looking at our phone program this fall just to evaluate how it was and how it was going. One of the things that we found out from it is that, like I said earlier, that the you know the classes of the 80s and 90s were not performing as well as um, even the more recent classes. You would think that uh, our more recent classes just you know just don't have the capacity to give. They just graduated. They're still looking for jobs or they're off to grad school. So we really dig dug deeper into the numbers and looked at. You know, the biggest reason why, you know, we don't call somebody in a phone program is we just don't have their number. <laughs> we don't have any number whatsoever for them. So when we did a cell phone to pen, and I just got the data back yesterday, as a matter of fact, we looked at, um, we sent out um, like 40, not 4,500, almost 10,000 records for phone to pens. From that, we've got over, uh, over, I can't remember, I want to say it was like, 35 or 4,500 uh, records back with new cell phone numbers. From that, we can extrapolate basically a third of those will be able to reach over our, our spring semester calling. That's going to be roughly 1,200 to 1,500 conversations that we're going to have with somebody in terms of making a gift. Now, of course, we're not going to get all of those as gifts. If we get 10% of those, though, that's 120 to 150. That's just based on the information that we're finding. That's not including everything that we're doing already. Those are just additional names and additional gifts that we, we can probably expect based on our previous uh, data and previous records. So what, what that tells me is that if we're not, we don't have some of these basic building blocks, it's hard for us to really move forward and get to some of the higher levels. I, I've been doing this for about 20 years, and one of the things that you know, I see some organizations doing great things in terms of matching gifts. And I see some organizations that don't have, you know, quite their full act together in terms of matching gifts. And, and by far, the biggest reason is organizational commitment. If you are committed to putting a matching gift program in place, and it doesn't take a lot of additional resources or extra extra FTEs, it's it's more of just restructuring. I think many times what you're already doing and 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 and, and looking at data in a different way. But it all starts with organizational commitment. There's no use in going out and getting data or you know putting communication plans together if you don't have some if you don't have the commitment first to do all the things that you need to do. 
Once you do have the commitment, the next step is access to quality data. You can do appends on phone numbers, cell phones, all those things, which will allow you to eventually have pretty good data to get matching gifts. Even that in and of itself alone is not going to do it. The, the key thing and the last step to this and the, the one highlighted in blue is what's your, what's your process to educate and communicate with your donors? Building it into almost everything that you do. You really have to look at what you're already doing and tapping into them. For example, if you are sending out a magazine, why not include something in your magazine about matching gifts? If you're sending out a receipt, why not include something in there about matching gifts? It doesn't cost any additional funds to do that. It's a matter of adding a line or two uh, into what you're already doing just to remind people in letters. We do that as part of all of our letters. We have a PS in there that says, you know, your gifts may be eligible for a match. You can click on this link at the bottom that allows you to look at and see if there's any, ma if there's any matching gifts available. Some of the key statistics to remember with matching gifts, again, that 1 in 10 number, 10% 10 of all, all your gifts are eligible. You want to keep that metric, you want to keep that metric in mind, and at the very least know where you are towards that goal. And you should be, from year to year, you should be moving closer to that 10%. Some examples, ExxonMobil, uh, 1 million to both LSU and Texas A&M. That's just, that's just two schools. I would not be surprised if there's more than that. Those are just one that I've heard of. Approximately half of all the corporate 500 companies have a matching gift program. If you have a lot of, uh, or if you have some local, you know, corporate 500 programs, or have a lot of your constituents in there, that's something you really want to be aware of and know who they are. American Cancer Society quadrupled what they raised in three years from two to ten million, and they believe they can triple that again. Again, it's organizational commitment and just willing to do what it, to do what it takes to get to there. The you know, it goes back to this slide all the time. Organizational commitment, access to data, and then just repeat the process again with your donors. Um, and just based on the numbers that, um, that John has provided me from HEP, is I have a lot of the matching gift, matching gift company information, is that an, a, a net new matching gift company is added almost daily. Somewhere between probably three and 400, I imagine, new companies that are get, getting added per year. Just to give you a scope of what the size of uh, the matching gift pie is, and this is for the, there's about 140 million last year that was uh, given to matching gifts, but that is specifically out of the 667 institutions, and I apologize, my slide came off the screen there, of, of companies that reported to the Council for AIDS Education. This is from the CAE report. Um, what this tells me is that there's a lot more than that out there because there's over, you know, 2,500, 3,000 colleges and universities in the country, and that's, you know, that's probably a quarter of them. Uh, granted, probably more of the larger ones, but there's still it's only a quarter of all the records out there. So just in colleges and universities, that number is going to be much greater. This does not include all other nonprofits across, you know, healthcare, uh, arts, culture. So that number has got to be, you know three to four times that, and I would not be surprised if it's closer to the billion dollar range when you look at all the different types of nonprofits out there. The point I'm trying to make is that there's a lot of money out there in matching gifts, and there's a lot of it that gets unfulfilled. So make sure you're, you're getting your, you know, your portion of the pie that, um, that you can get. Uh, this is just looking at it in previous years. That was just, this one right here was in 2013. If you look at the numbers from 2010, it's about 140, so it's about that 140 million range that's out there. Again, this is for just uh, you know certain percentages of the school that are actually reported. Let me show you some of the results that we got when we did the um, in uh, employer find, or uh, this one's not ours, but this is I know another hospital foundation that did this. And what they did is they did an employer uh, uh, an e uh, excuse me an email append. They sent their records, which is about 24,000 records. Of that 24,000 records that were sent, uh, when they did the email append service, they found 5,467 records, which is 22%, which is pretty much on target. Um, it's usually around 20%. That's a little bit higher. But roughly, you know, if you can get 20% of your email addresses 
uh, you know, matched, just think about how much more effective your your um, your emails are that you send out. I know that we have 71% of our alumni da uh, database. We have a good mailable email, good emailable address for. That doesn't happen overnight, and I mean we spend dollars every year to make sure that we get that, so that we can you know make sure that we have very good data on on e uh, on emails. But again, if we do nothing, if we just do our if we do our newsletter that goes out, and we just update that information, that's a lot more effectiveness. Um, you know, by 22 percent more effective in terms of reaching out to people that we can be. So it's a it's a very valuable tool for us to do an email append. Uh, this is an employer find that was done a few years back, and I you know, have some older ones and some newer ones. This one, uh, Colby College was very nice to share their information. This was done in 2010, and they found 28% of their records had employment information, uh, or, or came back with some employment information. Of the, of the 200, or the 28%, which was about 7,000 records, it was kind of nice to see that 226 were CEOs, CFOs, or presidents. Uh, 27 were senior vice presidents, 106 were vice presidents. So again, very valuable information to get. Uh, we did this, uh, and I'll show you in, uh, what we did in New Haven recently. Here's some examples of the data that you get back with this. In this, you get the, you know, everything on the right hand of the screen over is information that was appended. So we find out who the employer is, what their title is, what industry that they're in, and in some cases there is business information that's associated with it. This is all the type of information that can be imported back into um, into your database. Uh, again, Colby, uh, an example of what they did from when they did their screening. They, again, 10%, and these numbers pretty much pan out all the time. Not always exactly 10%, but they get pretty darn close to it. 10% uh, of all gifts are eligible for a match. If you look at the almost 15,000 records that they sent in, 1,530 were eligible for a match. If you go down a little further and break it down between donors and non-donors, the donors um, were, uh, you know, two-thirds of them, and 70% of those were matched or a total gift amount of 423,000 or an average gift amount of 393. Yeah, that's money that's, that's just on the table that no one really knew about before. Even if you get a capture a small percentage of that, that's still a pretty healthy amount. Um, and, and these, I, you know, I've kind of seen these results uh, when we've done them from, you know, from year to year, and um, it, it's pretty much in the ballpark. We did our employer find at New Haven this year. Um, it's funny because John and I were talking about this right before, you know, he asked me to do our, our do the presentation a few months back, and we had just, you know, decided to do an employer find, and we did one in 2010, oh, excuse me, 2011, and 2012, 10, 12, and we just did one in the end of 14, but we got the, you know, the results back now in 15. And the interesting thing is that, you know, I try to think that we're very proactive with the employer find information that we do. But still, as we did this, um, you can see by the way, by this graph, that 35% uh, did not, we did not have a matching gift company in our records. So we found right off the bat, we found 35% that we just did not know were matching gift eligible companies. Um, and we try to think we're, and we think we're, we're proactive, but, and I believe we are, but still, information changes so quickly. 20%, the one in red right here, we already had company information in our records. 45%, we had the company in our records, but uh, um, already had the company in our records, but was found to match. But we didn't know that they were a matching gift company. So if you look at this, 45 and 35, that my math is correct, that is 80% we were able to update information for. Now, a lot of these were because we found new employment information that we did not have before from our employer uh, find. But again, you can see this is, you know, we're updating quite a bit of information on our database um, with employment information, and our matching gifts is only going to get significantly better from this. Uh, alumni working for a matching gift company found from employers, from the employer uh, search. We found, and, and we haven't gone through all these records. 
we found about uh, 2,054 records were found who worked, uh, who their employer worked for a matching gift company. From that, if you look at it, 73% um, uh, we, or, or excuse me, 41% new person was linked into Razor's Edge. And the red one is the 32%. The red has already had a person linked in Razor's Edge. And we still have 26% uh, 26 to go. So again, as you can see, we're updating quite a bit of our information um, on our alumni database. The biggest challenge that we have, and that is creating awareness. Um, again, that, that, that screenshot that I had, that we talked about uh, organizational commitment. We've talked about data and how you can get some of that data. And now the biggest challenge is creating awareness. And there's many different ways of doing that. And again, this is one of those things like the boxing analogy that I used earlier. You gotta try it from so many different ways because you're not quite sure what's gonna get the um, uh, your donor to, uh, to uh, jump in and, and get that gift match. One of the things right off the bat with, you know, you know as you talk to people and you talk to donors, People are willing to, you know, if they're willing to make a gift, they're probably willing to do whatever it takes to get the match done. A lot of them, A, just don't know about it, or B, if they do know about it, they say, oh, yeah, my company matches, but I don't know how to get, you know, I don't know how, what the process is. And getting that information to them is one of the biggest, uh, you know, value, add, value adds that you could offer. One of the things, and here's an example of what St. Jude's does, and that is that this is just an e-match page. An e-match page is part of their website. And, um, you know, I chose this because it could be, you know, any organization. You can be able to, um, you know, type in, and, you know, you put in your, type in your employer or company name in here. You put it on your website. And you can find out if they are eligible for match. You literally type in, you know, ABC company. If ABC company matches, it comes up. The nice thing about it is you can actually click on the link, which either brings down the form itself or points you to the direction of where it is on their website. So again, that excuse of I know we're eligible for match, but you know I don't know what to do can all go away with that. One of the things I find, as much as as you know we're using this for externally, you know for our donors, um, I'm using it a lot too because you know our major gift staff will say. Geez, you know, does, is, is this company a matching gift company? And I said, you know, you can look right on our website and find out, and I'll go through it with them. And unless they're doing it frequently, they kind of tend to forget. But it's very easy to get that information. Once they do it two or three times, they kind of remember, oh, yeah, that's where it is on our website. And they're able to do that and pull that information down themselves. Uh, here's an example of a small nonprofit and what they did with, a, with an e-match. With an e they had three, uh, 3,857 constituents click on their matching gift uh, lookup page. 78% of these searched for their company. 22 were able to find their company. And last year, they had 63 matching gift companies from 11 gifts. This year, um, after they promoted the website even more, they had 158 matching gifts from 27 confirmed companies. The point with this is, and the reason I have this slide up is, is that um, many companies, or many, uh, you know, you don't have to be a large organization or a small organization. This applies again, applies to all organizations, large and small, and medium size, in terms of just uh, being able to match gifts. So if you can double it from 63 to, or to, you know, to 168, or if you're a large organization, you go from, you know, 1,000 to 2,000. I mean, those are significant dollars, a significant impact. Again, it's just a matter of being committed to doing it, getting the right data that you need, and then just making people aware. I have some sample letters here uh, that uh, that we use, and you know, this is dear Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Got a match? We recently received your gift, and you put your organization name in there. And we are most grateful for it. You may not know, however, that your gift could be matched by your company if you contact your human resource department for the correct form to send us. And then it just kind of goes through the whole process on how to do it. Uh, again, uh, this is just an example or just a sample, uh, but uh, something that you want to do. One of the things that we do on a monthly basis, if I know somebody's eligible for a match, I, um, I can have one of my staff members go through and just run a query and say, who's eligible for a match that made a gift this month? 
if they're eligible for a match, we know they work for a matching gift company, uh, let's just send them a letter like this. Now that we have all this additional data, our numbers are actually going to go up much higher because we're just finding out more employment information and more matching gift information. But you know, on an average month, we probably send about 40 to 50. Would not be surprised if we're you know getting much higher as uh, and we're putting this data, this new data, into our system. So in summary, efforts to maintain current employment information can maintain uh, can benefit organizations in many ways from a major gift standpoint, from an annual fund standpoint, and uh, you know, from a matching gift standpoint. Individuals are the best source of employment information and should be solicited for their information at multiple points of contact, as we discussed earlier. Companies are increasingly providing services that will research employment information for nonprofit. Again, there's so much more data available today than there was in the past. It's just a matter of organizing it and having that organizational commitment to do it. Uh, and matching gifts potential can be identified and increased with more employment data from donors. We showed you some examples of a couple different organizations of what, um, you know, what is available out there. And you know, again, how close are you to that 10%? So the, there's reactive ways and proactive ways of doing this. A reactive way would be an e-match page, just like we have the uh, St. Jude's, St. Jude will have, that's just a more reactive where it resides on your website. More proactive way is doing that email append that we have from that hospital foundation where you're able to go out and get, you know, roughly 20% of your data and from there you're able to reach out to more people. The um, employer screening that we did, uh, and we, you know what, let me show you this, let me jump out of this for a second and show you the most recent one that we did. Um, we just did this one on uh, October 29th. We uh, got the data back. And from there, we sent 48,000 records at New Haven. And from the data that we sent out, we found 13,951 new employers, which is roughly, you know, almost 30% that we got back. That's 13,000 records. Now, for us, that's a lot of data that we found back. The nice thing, and where I, we were able to focus in on, the first group that we focused on were from our, our prospect research standpoint was our CEOs, presidents, and vice presidents. That's roughly 1,000 people that we have new employment uh, information for that we're really interested in. The director and trustee level two is also, but that needs a little further, a little, a little more research. Um, but as you can see, that's very valuable information. Uh, from there, you know, we're, we're finding quite, you know, we're, we found quite a bit of information. On, uh, on some of our top donors. So let me jump back into here. So you can see our employer screening found, found uh, uh, you know, almost 30%. So that's a great return on investment for us. Then we did our auto match process where we found 2,000 records uh, that had uh, matching gift records that we didn't know about so that we're updating our records for. And that was roughly about 9%. We didn't quite hit that 10%, but it was 9%. So again, it's just getting knowing those metrics with those numbers. With that, I am done, and I just want to leave some time for questions. So if there's any questions that anybody has, feel free to ask. Carl, thank you very much. Uh, that was great. <clears throat> Appreciate it. We do have a, quite a few questions. so. Um, if anybody has any, please send them to us electronically, and it looks like we have a few minutes here, so we should be able to get them answered. Um, <clears throat> one of the first questions will be the PowerPoint, will it be available? Uh, the answer to that question is yes, we will have it up on our website and uh, have that available to anybody who would like a copy. Um, just look at the Learning Center under webinars and give us a couple of days to get it up on the website, but uh, we will have it up there to, together with a copy of the webinar here so you can hear Carl as well. Um, <clears throat> next question is, uh, let's see, um, well, let's see here. Um, does the 10 percent apply to educational institutions or would it apply to nonprofits as well? That that ten percent applies um, across the board, from what I've seen. Um, it, you know, roughly one in ten 
Now, is it exactly 10 for everybody? No, probably not. And I, I, I've seen some where some organizations have, you know, gotten data back and they've gotten it at the 18, 19%. Um, those were outliers, but I've seen others, um, you know, nonprofits that are getting, you know, nine, you know, seven, 8%. Ten uh, percent is an average, um, and it's. I, I think you know, unless you actually run it and you actually look at the data, um, you know, I think that's. Um, I think that's. It's a good ballpark number to start with. Okay. Um. Question is, uh, uh, let's see here. They're uh, doing the process. They were sending letters and emails, but we don't get a lot of donors to turn in their forms. Looking for uh, suggestions on how to get those forms once the donation is made. Again, I, I think the uh... yeah, I got one comment on it, Carl. The the forms are available on the EMATCH donor link page, and uh, frequently what a lot of folks are doing is, is sending the forms or a link, um, you know, to donors they know work for matching gift companies. Some even go as far to fill out the forms uh, for their for their donors. So that's a couple of suggestions I've got. Carl? Yeah, no, the, 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 that's funny you say that because one of the things that we do for some of our top employers, we know some of some of our larger employers that are physically located to our campus and, you know, there's one there's one employer in particular where they have a thousand employees, uh, another one that has about 700 employees, uh, and another one that has in a couple hundreds. What we do for those people, our gift processing person actually has pre-printed forms for those, for some of the larger companies, and she automatically includes that as part of the package that goes to them. There's not a lot of thinking involved with that. Oh, it's XYZ company. XYZ company we know is a matching gift company. Let's just include that sheet of paper in there on how how to go about and get a match for the actual form itself. So um, definitely, you know, people aren't. You, you got to make it easy for them. You got to remind them. You got to provide the links. And again, it's kind of like the boxing analogy. So you got to hit them high, hit them low, and hit them many different ways. Some people like doing electronically. Some people like it, you know, in paper form. Uh, you you try many different ways. And again, bringing awareness to it, making sure that that's part of the magazine that you know, if you send any other communication pieces, it goes out, so that there's just it, it's ingrained in them almost all the time. We also we also on occasion will have like a a, a thankathon where we thank all of our call you know our do, our callers will call our donors, thank them, and we'll select out the matching gift companies and just. You know, say thank you for your gift. Oh, by the way, did you know your gift was eligible for matching care? How you go about getting the form? Um, so it's it's not one way, but many different ways, and eventually they will fall in the boxing analogy. Right. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> next question is: uh, Are the fees uh, flat and clearly charged, or do you charge the number of records? Um, and maybe I can handle that one for employer fine. Um, <clears throat> The um, we charge by the based on the hits. So in other words, we're only charging for found records. Is how we charge for employer find, um, and HEP does provide that. Um, you know, to tons of clients every year, and we'll actually let you t um, do a test if you if you're interested. Uh, you know, we'll certainly send us. A, Send us a small number of records, 100 records or something, and we'll be happy to do a little test for you so you can see what the results might look like. And um, you can just contact us at our uh, info at hepdata.com, and we'll be glad to get back to you and set up a doing a little test for you. Um, here's a question. How accurate is the data? You know, in terms of the employer find or the auto match, so yeah. I can answer both. In terms of just what you know, what I you know what I can give you, the um, the employer find, and then that's probably what you know you're most interested in. is pretty darn accurate. I mean, a lot of the things that we're bouncing, you know, one of the sources is is LinkedIn information, and that 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 link is coming over. So um, you know, it, it when it's matched on that, it's pretty darn accurate. 
Now, there's going to be there's some false positives where you know it's not the right person, but those are by far the exception. They're not the rule. You know, I guess one of the things that I do is, you know, when you look at like looking at something at, on LexisNexis, I'm going through and I'm putting in the name. You know, and I'm sure when I say this, people in the uh, in the audience will understand. Is you're you know you're looking at it from many different ways, and you're you're very sure that it's the right person, you know, when you're looking at it in Lexus and Nexus, because you're trying it different ways. Um, you're not gonna, there's no way you can have that same degree of confidence when you're doing it uh, across the board. But with the LinkedIn data, since uh, that, that is now part of this information, it has gotten significantly better. Uh, but, there, you know, there, uh, there are occasionally going to be some false positives, because that's, that's, you know, part of the cost of doing business. Uh, and if there's ever any question, um, one of the slides that I had, it, it, it showed, you know, when, when we did it last time, um, let's see if I can find it, uh, there was some that needed additional research on. I think I bounced through that one pretty quickly. Uh, here on this one right here, I think I kind of bounced through this slide pretty quickly. But um, when we did this in 2011, total new employers added was 1,378. Total selected fields updated was 1,062. So, you know, we had 90% changes in our data. Uh, total no changes was 40. Um, our total for additional research was 169. That's really what I was or in the 169. So roughly, you know, 10% was we needed additional research or it was undecided because we couldn't make that match. You know, in terms of overall, you know, it's not 100%, but if I can get 90% and I can get 90% at one time, that's a pretty darn good number for me. And, um, you know, those that I, I'm not sure on, I either put aside or, you know, I just don't, I don't look at. Yeah. The one thing I would add to that, Carl, is um, with the advent of the social network data, in, which has just happened in the last 18 months or so, we're currently matching on, obviously, the name of the donor. We're matching on the school name. So it would have to say New Haven University. It would also have to have the same degree and the same graduation year. This is, you know, pertains to colleges. Um, but for a nonprofit, it would have, you know, uh, other fields we match on are email addresses and uh, address information. So uh, the data has gotten a lot more accurate, and uh, we're able to deliver a lot more of it now since we've got better sources. So um, another question here. Do employer matches include only new information, or did you send along information you already had in your records? Uh, we sent along information that we already had in our records. Um, and because one of the things that I like to do is it would either uh, reaffirm or not reaffirm what we had. So I like I like sending all the information. But you know what? I also separated those out because those aren't the ones that I'm going to look at first. Um, one of the things that I included as part of the data was the date that we last updated that record. Um, so if I had information that was, you know, updated as of a certain point in time, at least when I'm comparing, I can see both. So I don't know if that answers the question or not, but um, yeah, that's kind of how I how I approached it. Right. One of the other the new reports that we're doing is by industry, and Sonia asked if uh, we kept any statistics by industry, and we we do keep it by major, um, and uh, I think we keep some of the data by industry as well. So uh, we can um, give you slices, percentage of data that uh, was updated in, um, by industry type thing is available. So let's see. Um, one of the other questions was, who did you use for your email append? Uh, we we used TAP, um, and but I've used other sources too. I you know I kind of, John, I'm sorry to say this, but we we use multiple sources of information to get info, uh, to get email appends. And the reason why I like doing that is because I you know they come from a variety of different sources. Uh, but HEP is one of them, and we use some other ones too. We kind of rotate from year to year. Right. So here's another question. How much detail does employer find provide? Um, <clears throat> well, the two big things it gives you, the name of the company and the, and the title. Um, 
of the person that's working there. That's, it also gives you a social network link if we're able to find that. Um, and I think that's pretty much uh, what we what we provide. Um, the other thing does HEP provide match public and private employer information. A couple of our sources are um, the government sources, obviously, like Federal Election Commission is one public resource we do use. And we have a biographical database we use, which I think has got close to 100, 100 million uh, bios in it. And that gives us it's about 90% private uh, private company information. So we do use both public and private uh, sources in addition to uh, you know social networks out there. Um, and just to answer that, um, you know, just to the this screen that I have up right now to answer that question in a more visual format. Everything to the left is what we provided. You know, first ID, first, middle, last, city, state, zip, and email. Everything to the right is what HEP appended to our data. This is when we did it last time, so it did not include the social media links. But just as, um, you know, out column to, uh, to R over here, the next column over after date, if I showed you that one, would have uh, the social media link, whether it be Facebook, LinkedIn, or any other social media site. So this is kind of the, this is what it, this is the data of what it looks like what it looks like when you get it back. And the question in here from Deborah, she's asking, how much vetting do you do before uploading employer data? Um, example: data services or tables out there that will quickly categorize employers. Um, any. Yeah, and that's a very good question. That's an excellent question. One of the things that we, uh, what I do is, if we don't have any information on anybody, if it's completely new, and that's why I like including that date that that um, that we, you know, that we appended or the date that we last updated. If we have no information on anybody, I'll just append those as is. I'd rather have something that's incorrect. I mean, we we re we don't know who they are off the bat. We haven't had any information ever whatsoever. At least when I do my tracer, they're more apt to respond to that. Um, if they're if they're a major gift if they're a major gift signed prospect, I have somebody look through those individually. Those that we have uh, information for, I look on the date. And but quite honestly I'm looking I'm scanning through those I, and I'm having somebody scan through those and look for anomalies in there. So uh, it Part manual, part you know electronic, um, and part you know we, we have in between that we look at uh, you know we can look at lots of records at one time on a spreadsheet. That helps answer that question. Okay, a couple of questions here. <clears throat> um, on employer find the employers returned are current or current and former. Uh, employer find usually only looks back in in the databases. Uh, two and a half years or so, it won't return anything that's older than that. Um, and it's primarily current information that we're, uh, we're providing back to the uh, school or the, or the nonprofit. And um, the next question is, how would I use your service to see ratios of matching? For example, what employers match one-to-one, -one? Um, that, that type of information. Um, from what I've seen, I, I mean, 20 years ago, we had a lot of companies that matched four to one, three to one, two to one. I think that has, um, you know, has become much smaller percentage, but um, there's still a fair amount. Um, and John, you probably know the numbers better than than I do. I thought yeah. the last time I looked, it was about 10, about 15 percent or so, 20 percent that matched I'd more than or one to one. I'd say 90 percent are one to one, um, and the rest are two to one or three to one like Exxon is. Uh, Fidelity up in Boston is two to one. There are still, um, um, but that's about it, 90% are one to one. Uh, I guess we got the, a couple more questions here. Does, um, how does New Haven utilize career services in capturize, capturing employment data? Um, I'll, I'll answer that just an overall way. Then you could uh, um, have provides many, many uh, colleges and universities career services with employment information. 
for their outcome reporting. So they can tell them where recent grads are, um, you know, um, currently working. So uh, we, we do provide a lot of that. you have any comment on that, Carl, or not? Yeah, we, we work closely with our, um, with our um, career services office. Um, at one point, we were actually under the same reporting um, unit, uh, but then we moved that, uh, you know, a few years back. But anyway, anyways, um, they use career services uses our data when they do surveys because um, they're we're the best source that they have for the information. Um, it's not the most, you know, it's not always complete, but based on what's available, um, they do exports and will do surveys based on our Razor's Edge database. So um, they are direct beneficiaries of this. It, the next question is, can we send spouse information along as well for matching? Um, the, the answer to that would be uh, yes. You could certainly send that along. Um, about, I want to say around 10% of the matching companies, uh, maybe it's a little higher than that, maybe uh, will match spouse. Um, uh, match the spouses, so um, it is worthwhile pursuing, although uh, I don't think we get a lot of it, but we do get some of it. But uh, Next question, uh, sorry to keep racing here. <laughs> uh, let an employer find how much confidence should we have in the business addresses returned? I, I'll answer that. Um, we don't get it, uh, business addresses on a lot of uh, the records, um, but we're getting them from the same source that we're getting the company and the, um, um, we'll frequently give you the links to where we uh, are getting the information from. So you can look on the social network or the private company website where we where we got the data from. So we would do provide that uh, to you so you can um, check them out if, you, if, you, if you'd like to, so, well, it is now 3 o'clock. I want to just uh, say thank you to everybody for the great questions. Um, remember, we will, we're will happy to do a test for you. And Carl, thank you for your time and effort in putting this all together. It was, it was great. We appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.